Welcome to another episode of Startup Junkies Podcast. Uh, thank you for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Um, go ahead, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Um, this is Caleb Talley with the Startup Junkie team, joined by my co-host, uh, Jeff Emeron and Davis McIntyre. How's it going, guys? It's Friday. Everywhere in America. <laughs> Friday, you've got some bourbon, beer. Um, <laughs> all the fixings. All the Cheers. fixings to uh, talk about food and beverage. Today, so we're ready for uh, and we are joined today by our special guest, uh, Kim Bearden of Curate. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I said that right. Curate. You not did. Not Curate. Curate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Short-term memory loss, but not that short-term. <laughs> <laughs> so give us the origin story for yourself and curate. Mm, Okay, so I'm gonna take us back to the financial collapse of 2009. No, no, no. Yes, and so at the time, um, I went to American University, I studied marketing in Spanish, and my intention was that I wanted to work in the arts industry. Um, I had worked for different nonprofit art galleries and uh, the American Film Institute. My mind has always thought about what's the high level message that something, an art exhibit, for example, wants to communicate down to the font on the wall. What's that whole user experience look like? Uh, perhaps that is why I've called this business curate a little mm-hmm. foreshadowing here um, because I wanted to be a museum curator so unfortunately in said financial collapse not a lot of jobs in the arts industry and so I had put myself through school hostessing parties for upper northwest DC families I take coats make drinks etc and at one of these soirees, um, there was a gentleman there that was like, who are you? I'm like, what, what are you doing here? I think it was like a baby shower. You know, what's, what are you doing at this intimate affair? And I had said who I was. And he was like, well, I run the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration. Uh, we're hiring. If you ever need a job, you know, look at our job site. I was like, OK, whatever. You know, this is not the career path I had intended. And uh, From that moment, I then had my resume on the American University Career Web, and the FBI found my resume. And they called me in for an interview, (laughs) and I was like, again, there aren't a lot of jobs out there. What the hell? I could be Jennifer Gardner and Alias. Why not? And so I. One of my favorite characters. (laughs) And so I, you know, went for the interview, and I was asked very vague questions like, tell us a problem you had. And I was like, what do I tell them? Mm-hmm. And um, anyways, I, I, I then got a conditional offer and I started that very long process. But my loans are kicking in, so I thought I need a job in the meantime. And again, like I said, it's 2009, not a lot out there. So I go and work for the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration. <laughs> And so I started doing um, manager's licenses, solicitor's licenses, temp permits for weddings and events, imports of alcohol into the district. And I was meeting all these bar and restaurant owners who would come to me and be like, finally, someone who knows how to use a computer. And I was like, what (laughs) is going on here? And I was hearing all this rhetoric of, you know, small business, the backbone of the American economy. And I was like, why is it so hard for people to start and run businesses? I don't understand. So then I started learning more and more about what does it take to start and run a small business, specifically food and beverage in the district. And then I just learned more about the industry that way. And then Whole Foods found me uh, in that process. And they had asked me to apply for their Northern Virginia store that had been open about six years. They hadn't seen a lot of customer count increase or basket size increase. And they said, you should apply for this job. Um, At that time, Whole Foods was known for doing a lot of promotion from within, not having someone from the outside. And I was in my early 20s. So all around, I was just like, what's going on? Okay, again, what the hell? Let me give it a try. And so I had that interview. It was actually even more intense than a lot of FBI interviews I had. It was really, (laughs) really strict. Um, And I got the job and it was this first really divergent path for me between do I stick on the route that my baby boomer parents may have decided, government stability, et cetera, again, financial collapse, or do I choose my values? Do I choose this thing that is for some reason calling to me 
to go work in a grocery store. Uh, and that's ultimately but a really cool. Grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> but not even like what it is today. Right. Yeah. It's still it was still in this. Um, yeah. In the beginning of the massive growth stage. Yeah. And so I chose to work for Whole Foods. And literally four days later, I was called and was like, you're cleared. When can you start? Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, I'm going to work in the private sector. And they were like, oh, like name management consulting agency, you know, Deloitte. And I was like, nope, a grocery store. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And so then I worked for Whole Foods. I ended up opening a store from scratch in downtown DC. They put me on the track to then be a store team lead and and run a Whole Foods. Uh, I had one of these other moments of like, is this what I want to do with my life? Now it's 2013, rise of Instagram and Twitter. I got really interested in how online behavior affects offline purchasing. And I went back to school at Georgetown for digital media management and analytics to try and understand that question even more. How how do these two things relate? And that pushed me into the food tech world. And the last job I held before starting Curate uh, this business was based in Brooklyn, but I still lived in DC and I launched new markets for them. So I would go, I went to Chicago, Austin, Seattle, New York, and their product was putting chefs in people's homes. So you would go on this site and say, I'm having a dinner party for 10 people. My budget's 50 a person. Make me an offer. And chefs would bid on you. You know, we've seen That's this cool. movie, and we know yeah. that you're, you're actually still an undercover agent for the FBI. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> it was a nice try. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Lots just, of people think this, actually. Um, think, and just to tell you about that, you know, the, the finale here is that that company raised $20 million. I was reporting to the C-suite, and because I was launching new markets, kept asking, you know, what what's the growth plan here? I need to know. Um, and I felt at the time treated like put baby in the corner. Like, you don't know, little girl. And I was like, actually, I think I do know. And I'm confused as to how you're going to pay this back plus returns or have an acquisition strategy. I just, I'd like some clarity. And it, that planted this seed, you know, in me, this like fire in my belly of, I'd like to work with people that, I don't know, care about stable cash flow, who actually build businesses that are of and from their communities. Um, and that was really what, again, lit my launched fire you, to start Curate. Launched you back towards helping small business. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where fundamental economics still apply. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I still have to imagine that you were making some pretty mean cocktails to get the attention of the um, alcohol regulation <laughs> bureau. Uh, yeah, like I a, don't even I don't even know what I was making. It was a brunch. It probably was just like mimosas and bloody marys. <laughs> <laughs> Some good bloody marys. Apparently. Yeah, that's amazing. Though. So tell us a little about about kind of you know what the premise of Curate is and um, you know mm-hmm. those early days of that. Yeah, so Curate exists to shift the dollar back into our local communities by building an empowered supply and meet a changing consumer demand. The two uh, focus words there should be supply and demand. And so on the empowered supply side, one piece of the business is our entrepreneurship education curriculum. Uh, This is specifically for entrepreneur, food and beverage entrepreneurs who are at this growth stage where maybe they're in farmer's markets and now they're considering wholesale. It's a farmer who's been growing produce and now they're considering value add. Maybe it's a food truck who's now considering catering or a brick and mortar. That inflection point where they've done a thing for a certain period of time, and now they're considering what's my next business development strategy, marketing strategy, sales strategy, to diversify their revenue stream. And ideally, it's a founder, owner, operator who maybe was the person standing at the farmer's market every single weekend, and now they have to hire somebody. (laughs) It's like, what does that brand look like outside of myself? And so Curate Courses is designed for that exact growth stage. And over time, graduating entrepreneurs through Curate Courses, uh, you can imagine being that we are here startup junkie, I'm definitely sure you can imagine the amount of pick your brain emails (laughs) one gets. Um, And, you know, an inbound of, so I'm in the farmer's market, I'm in a local coffee shop, like now what do I do? Like now what happens? And because I'm a grocery expat, I understand, and hello, we're in Northwest Arkansas, 
There's one side of our food supply chain that is grocery retail. It's very much big getting bigger. And so I started looking at the other side of the food supply chain being food service. And so the second part of the Curate ecosystem, the demand side, is that we have a proprietary procurement platform and we embed as the master supplier of local goods at food service locations such as universities, hospitals, convention centers, sports arenas, because these big business systems are set up to buy from other big businesses. Mm-hmm. You know, they, it's just one management company buying from Broadliner, Cisco, Pepsi, et cetera, et cetera. They don't go to the pie person, to the kombucha person. They're just not gonna do that. And so Curate holds this contract to be that local purchasing team. And then we find that and source product based on the demand needs of that account. And then they only have to do one placement of order, pay one accounts payable, and we then pay out the small businesses from whom we're sourcing. So ideally the Curate ecosystem is this, again, building up the supplier to then meet these demand channel opportunities. Yeah. We're based in D.C. and now second hub here in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, well, That's what I'm wait, doing wait, wait, here. Wait, yeah, I was going to say, what, what, what brought you out here from D.C.? Ooh, you want the real story? You know, I always say, I don't know. <laughs> as, you, as you heard before, I always say bourbon and bad habits. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bad habits. Bad yeah. Bad habits. Sorry. So I, you can imagine on the procurement side with the COVID times, Lots of food service accounts have had to change. Universities closed, corporate cafeterias closed. What is a convention center? You know, just so I was having my own like, what is the purpose of Curate? Because a lot of people were telling me, use what you've built and pivot towards more of a direct to consumer model. What what neighborhoods might want to group purchase together as an example? And I was like, no. I do not want to kowtow to this like moment in time. And I kept saying like, in nature, there are death cycles and birth cycles. We are in a massive death cycle. Curate was not meant for this time. We were meant for the rebirth. (laughs) And so I like held on to that, (laughs) even though, you know, financially real hard times, like not gonna lie here. And um, I was like, what am I gonna do to really think about Like, again, where does Curate grow next? Or or what does this evolution or pivot look like? So I got in a car to get out of DC because I kept thinking, okay, I've always lived and worked in places that from a tax-based perspective are like wealthier states. Mm -hmm. And so what's going on and not the coasts? I just want to know. Are people just like, oh, well, Amazon, you know, like what, what's happening? And instead of me guessing, I'm just gonna go ask people. So I drove to West Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, Southern Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. And on this journey, um, I have a podcast called The Tidbit and it's called The Tidbit because it's tidbits of knowledge on starting and running a small business with a food and beverage lens. So I said I was doing The Tidbit Takes the Road. (laughs) And my only like, markers for the journey were the interviews I scheduled. And then everything in between, I just sort of left up to a chance fate, I don't know. And so I had these different interviews and when I got here and I arrived to Bentonville specifically, I I was like, okay, it was a farmer's market day. And I was like, this is cool. And where does one grow if they're in the farmer's market? It seems to me that there's farmer's market and Walmart. Where's the in-between? Where's the opportunity for growth in the in-between? How do you create a more vibrant local ecosystem? And I had, um, on this journey, I ended up meeting with um, folks at the Northwest Arkansas Council, just asking more about like economic development strategy. And I pretty much said what I just said here. And, you know, I continued on my way. (laughs) I just kept driving. And then I got back to DC and it just so happened that same team put out the LifeWorks Here incentive. And I said, I'm not a remote worker, but should I apply for this? My intention would be to launch Curate here in Northwest Arkansas. Is that of interest? And they were like, yeah, like anyone, you know, apply. And I was like, okay, I will. And so 30,000 people applied. They picked 30 people. 
Garriott was one of them. Congratulations. Wow. Congratulations. Did they have the that's bicycle huge. or the 10K? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess both. I'm not yeah. <laughs> I'm not a cyclist, but I feel like now I have to be. You kind of have to. Yeah. 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 It's part of the cult. Yeah. It's almost a cult. Really. Yeah. I mean, you got to have at least a gravel bike. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I did know that the next place Curate would launch was not going to be a New York, Chicago, LA. Like, sure. I, I already mm-hmm. knew that as much. I wasn't. And then that was sort of it. Like, and I suppose I also was thinking about these intangibles, like the the stickiness of an area, mm-hmm. like a confluence of consumers who are desiring a new a new economic order. Sure. Like the education and, and awareness that there could be a new way of operating an entrepreneurial ecosystem. So I I knew the the factors that needed to be there. Well, you, you, you landed in a place that is what Austin now wishes it still was. Mm, okay. Now Being Austin, an Austin, now Austin, I can, I can attest. I can right, attest. Right? Now yeah. Austin yeah. is LA and we're not. Yep. We're like Austin yeah. almost 25 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Oh, interesting. The better Austin. So a better That's right. Austin. That's right. Okay. Point. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not as hot and we have better mountains. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. exactly. Anyway, well, welcome. We're, we're, we're glad you're here. Have you been able to get immersed and kind of in the local food scene with the the Karen Indies of the world and all that. I have that met Karen, yes. Yeah. And um, so a little bit of a sidetrack here. At the same time I found out about being awarded this you know, honor, we also got into this social enterprise um, business fellowship in DC. So I found out about Northwest Arkansas in January, but then I had this business fellowship. So I actually just arrived last month in July. So the fact that I have descended here with you all so quickly, uh, plus I've met the Karens of the world. I'm, Excellent. I'm feeling really... And how did we connect? What was yeah. the connection there? I guess I should know that, but I don't know. <laughs> Through that Morgan. Yeah. Through Morgan. Morgan. Well, and that yeah. explains it all. Yes, yes. and Morgan yeah. and I were the introduced through um, Jeanette by Isa Collins. Yeah, yeah. And, um, Another startup junkie. Yes, I? and so I feel... Honestly, very grateful and blessed to already feel such community, oh, and and I wasn't. It's good to know. That's not what I expected. So that's good on you, Northwest Arkansas. <laughs> and when this episode airs, we'll probably also be announcing the successful award of a USDA grant. Oh, probably. wouldn't that yeah. be great? We applied yeah. for one together. So <laughs> did we really mm-hmm. knock so, on? So yeah. we're, we're in that we're in that deal together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is awesome. I know. I'm excited. How about that? You show up and you win an award. <laughs> and another really cool thing based on the the timing of when this might all air, um, we're actually in partnership with Forge, uh, which is a CDFI mm-hmm. and community development yeah. financial institution. Yeah. Uh, and Forge is uh, presents Curate Courses. They are awesome. funder to run oh, Curate awesome. Courses that's here yeah, this awesome. fall. So we'll be launching applications. We'll have 10 businesses as a part of our cohort. Outstanding. And then it culminates with, you know, capstone pitch competition where I'll give out 5K cash prize. That's you very know, cool. Let's, let's get it. into some of the specifics of, yeah. of the whole food value chain, supply chain. Yeah. It occurs to me, this is one of the things that we see when when people are developing a product, get to a certain point, they face this issue of, I really like to have more distribution, but I don't have the capital to do the manufacturing myself. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a jungle out there to find a co-packer that's not going to ruin, smash, or steal your business. That's true. What are, what are your thoughts on that? What kind of guidance do you have for those companies that say, you know, I've got this really cool whatever it is, yeah. we've outgrown our pilot plant, maybe over at the university at the- AFIC. At, the, at AFIC, mm-hmm. at the, the Arkansas Food Innovation Center. What advice do you have for them? What should they be thinking about? Yeah, I would first say, what is your intended growth strategy? Because I recently spoke to a, a young woman who wanted to get into um, selling her bread. And so she immediately jumped to, I'm gonna use a co-packer to bake my bread and then par bake it and freeze it. And that this co-packer was not based in Arkansas, but in a different state. And I said, okay, awesome. You've done that due diligence. Now, is that bread going to come to you on a pallet? How long is the shelf life? Where's the sales channel for us? Do you intend to sell it to 
a school district? Do you intend to sell it at some farmer's markets? And she was like, oh, well, you know, my friend over here said that they'd buy some, and this (laughs) person over there said they'd buy some, and the farmer's markets. And I was like, okay, okay. And I was like, all right, so what's their minimum order quantity? Um, Like, what's the smallest amount you might be able to sell through? And they were like, oh, well, they said they could like even overnight me a couple of cases. And I was like, overnight? bread that's going to be expensive like have you thought about that as a part of your cost per unit so anyway this is a roundabout way of saying the intention of curate courses is not to define what success looks like for somebody but the way in which you might want to look for a co-packer means is your goal that you want to enter into walmart is it that you want to um, service all of the restaurants in the area like what is what's the Goal Start with the end in mind. Mm-hmm. Yes, because yeah. otherwise that co-packer is another person you have to be in relationship with. Sure. I mm-hmm. always say this, business is about relationships, not, you had mentioned this earlier, not just transactions. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that co-packer wants to know you're going to pay them. They're going to want to grow with you. Like they have to retool their operations in order to now put your product on the line. Mm-hmm. And so you're gonna to have to answer those questions even for them, not just a potential funder, like that co-packer is gonna to wanna to know, how are we gonna be in business together? So for you to just be like, oh, I'm growing. Like, <laughs> someone's gonna make my product now. You know, it doesn't, you gotta have a plan. So that's the, yeah, that's Food the entire goal. It's a tough business, yeah. isn't it? I mean, it's difficult. Small margins. I mean, small margins, Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's difficult to make it work for sure. Mm-hmm. And I think that folks who get into it because maybe they made cheesecake and they brought it to their church or community center and everyone was like, this is delicious. You should start a business. (laughs) I'm sure, again, we've heard this before. That's beautiful. And how many cheesecakes would you need to sell in order to recoup the salary that you make at your job? Just, you know, just do some like back of the napkin math there uh, and then figure out how to sell from there. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes you go through with the business and you look at the plan and the projections and the different things they're thinking about. And it's like, you really want to commit three to five to, you know, n number of years of your life for a business that's not even going to pay you a salary you can make at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of you, we have to have those kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. It's true. And I can't even give my tomatoes away in the break room, so I'm most definitely yeah. not going to be able to go to the farmer's market and recoup. Tomato pr- yeah, I'm not going to do it. But I will say, like, the opposite side of that is, I think, especially in the state of COVID times we are now, particularly in the hospitality industry, people don't want to feel like cogs in the machine no, anymore yeah, right, right, and yeah. want agency and ownership of their time, yeah. and that often outweighs money. How do you see that sorting out? So it's a good question. So yeah. within hospitality, we see, you know, bars, restaurants, other location hotels are having a devil of a time getting mm-hmm. staff. Yeah. What, what, what do you, how do you think that sorts out? I think we're going to have a total change in the way these businesses are structured because they haven't been putting their values first. They've just... Again, people just feel like you don't take care of me. You don't even care that I'm here. You're paying me at minimum wage, sometimes below. And so I I find that the <laughs> supply side of the equation is finally sticking up for themselves and being like, okay, even if I'm being paid something that maybe I'm not, is l- lesser than what I'm worth, I at least care about the thing that I'm working for. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm hoping and desiring that the small businesses that emerge from this time truly define what that mission is and, and what values and what they stand for. Because I think this sort of, you know, the strike at Arby's or <laughs> whatever it might be is just like, well, they don't care about me. Yeah. So, like, why yeah. should I care about them? Well, they're getting right. dumped on by people in their day to day all day long mm-hmm. in those type of roles too. So there's like you know who you're working for doesn't have a north star and doesn't you don't feel that they care about you. Then taking crap from 
people behind the counter yeah. all day long it makes it that much more unbearable. Mm-hmm. So it's a war for talent. Yeah. Yeah. It's a war really for is. talent. And if you don't realize as a, as a business owner or a corporation or whatever, that the people are your number one asset, mm-hmm. you're not going to be successful. Mm-hmm. My prediction. Yeah. You just You have to take care of your people. Richard Branson is a good one that says, if you, if you take really good care of the people on your team, you don't have to worry about customer service because they'll take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. And it's a good mm-hmm. philosophy. Fred Smith at FedEx used to say, people service profit. You focus mm-hmm. on the people first. <laughs> they'll provide extraordinary service. You'll have profit. Mm-hmm. It's really true. And yeah. it's common sense, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, get, you know, people are not cogs. And I, I think that there's... The best businesses with the strongest cultures are going to attract the best people and everyone else will suffer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The plantation days are done. Mm -hmm. Right. And I am curious in spaces where there has been one or a few predominant industries and now the community of those industries is demanding a new culture. What happens? That's what I'm very curious about is like, what happens when the middle of let's call them like the Olive Gardens and Fuddruckers of the world, like what happens when those like our strip malls that have been just built up like crazy over the past decades, that goes away. What comes in that place? Is it just going to be the big of the big or are we going to create space for the small to really survive and thrive? And I think that's us as consumer citizens like every day we vote with our dollar yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. and that's our like burgeoning hashtag at curate shift the dollar <laughs> yeah. because the, it matters. And, and to just be like, Oh, I'm like the convenience is just so extraordinary. And like, I just <laughs> like need that. It's like, well, you've made a choice. And then the next day you wake up and like, how'd this happen? Where are all my small businesses? Mm-hmm. Well, you were a part of that. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I, I hope that everyone can, I hope that this moment in time also makes us all look more accountable as to what we are part in this like global efficient supply chain. Yeah, but you offended uh, Olive Garden is one of our sponsors, so you yeah. just offended yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. All actually yeah. sponsors them off the list, yeah. along with fifty other multinational brands. Right. right. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's all right. Well, Kim, I know you talked about your uh, curates like consumer demand solution mm-hmm. uh, side. What's what's the kind of road? Uh, what does that road look like uh, in Northwest Arkansas mm-hmm. specifically? Like learning the you know supply yeah. ecosystem and all that, and Definitely. how's that? How are y'all going about that? Yeah. So curate courses is really the the foundation of learning right. the supply side, mm-hmm. and so then on the demand side. Hopefully, knock on wood, we have this USDA grant together, which is around value chain coordination. But the way in which we look at those accounts, again, hospitals, universities, corporate cafeterias, sports arenas, convention centers, is understanding from those, um, typically, there are management companies that service those spaces. And the client is the hospital or Mm -hmm. the university. And so each one of these spaces have typically a reason why they're interested in changing their procurement practices. It could be sustainability initiatives, it could be diversity, equity, inclusion. So the client is now changing their tune about procurement and wanting more values-based procurement and Mm. not just lowest bidder procurement. And then the constituents, whether it be the student or the hospital patient, is also demanding a different quality of care Mm -hmm. or service. Mm -hmm. And so that um, space is the most prime for us to work with because I don't have Mm -hmm. to change their mind. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. they're already like thinking about it. I know I need this. I just don't know how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, here I am. (laughs) I will help you make it happen. (laughs) But also uh, something that um, Morgan on your team and I have been exploring is what does it look like for entrepreneurs to even grow between this region, but also here in Tulsa? Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a lens. Super I, regional. Kind yeah, of, right, right, exactly. Right. That's a lens I bring from the Mid-Atlantic is we think about how entrepreneurs grow between Baltimore and D.C. and D.C. Right. and Richmond. And what does that regional economy look like? 
not mm-hmm. just DC specific or Baltimore specific. So that's what I'm also excited about is not just the anchor institutions here, but within like a two hour drive. Right. Because if you have a right. you know that's a purchase true. order that's worthwhile, two hours, I mean, it's not, not that big not of a deal. Not that bad. Yeah. Not that bad. Yeah. I mean, that whiskey's yeah, that three hours away. The whiskey's yeah. three <laughs> hours away. Exactly. <laughs> that is a, three and a half hours. Yeah, mm-hmm. true. And out here, because it's not like the Capitol Beltway, you can mm. drive 90 miles an hour. Yeah. It's amazing. Exactly. Right. And but so, you will get a ticket yeah. uh, in Pineville on your way to Kansas City. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah and and so to your time. question, I think about like Northwest Arkansas as the hub, mm-hmm. but then there's like spokes and like Absolutely. a radius from yeah. here yeah. that what is that opportunity mm-hmm. beyond just here? I mean, starting here. But right, then right, how do, no, how do no. you sort of radiate from this core? Mm-hmm. No, of course. So, so being answer. someone that grew up on the East Coast, mm-hmm. what were your expectations of the heartland? Because mm-hmm. uh, I, I tend to find this. I've been, all, I've been all over the country. <laughs> I, lived in, I lived back in, I was a Naval Academy graduate. I lived back in Washington, Baltimore, D.C. Mm-hmm. a lot of years. And I found people back there to be really geographically myopic about mm. anything in the middle. Mm-hmm. So what was the most surprising thing? I should also say I'm a Jersey girl. What so exit? What exit? No exit. I'm from actual Garden State part of New Jersey, uh, okay. not the Turnpike. <laughs> See, that's the thing. Uh, when yeah. you find somebody's from Jersey, yeah. you're like, what exit? I uh, the know. Jersey Turnpike. Sorry. I, no, I grew up across the street. See, that's a 40-year-old joke. <laughs> <laughs> it never gets old. Sorry. I grew up across the street from a cow and corn farm, so perhaps that's some part of these food roots here. But yeah, the 95 stretch has always been my turf, DC to New York. And yeah, it's totally different than here, obviously. Um, I think that one big thing I've recognized is I am pretty forthright and direct. And so I'm always like navigating spaces of like, ooh, what is this person telling me, but they're not really telling me? Like, what's the like, Un, like by telling me this fact that you just said, there's all this other subtext of what you might be telling me about yeah. this project initiative, et cetera. That's interesting to me. Um, and then two, I think from a coastal perspective, I'm gonna lean into some of the like tropes here of when I'm in DC, there's a lot of um, social codes that are abided by around the time we're living in, masks, vaccinations, et cetera. And when I say I'm doing that classic DC, Arkansas commute, they're like, oh, (laughs) what? (laughs) There? (laughs) What could be there? You know, a little nose down. And so I'm here to prove that, you know, I'm bringing the flag back, now it's a great place to be. But yeah, I think there are these Attitudes. Attitudes yeah. Mostly and perceptions. Mostly by people who have never been here. Yeah, right, right. And no conversely, idea. I'll say even Arkansans who have a view of D.C., yeah. right? And a lot of people see D.C. as a one industry town being government. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like to say I live in the District of Columbia, not Washington, because <laughs> yeah, there yeah. is like a culture and people <laughs> who live there. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm... I hope that between the two, these two lives, I'm leading some more awareness or, or mm-hmm. curiosity can be afforded yeah. to both yeah. communities. Yeah. You're an unofficial ambassador to yeah. the yeah, district. You are. So, yeah. 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 You've been appointed. Yes. Okay. A representative. Right? I can't yeah. wait. Yeah. Food and beverage rep. <laughs> we love it, though. Mm-hmm. Um. So any interesting anecdotes? I know you talked about some of the, like the tropes and stuff like that, but like interesting anecdotes from, you know, since you've been here a month that you would share. Mm. Well, maybe this isn't a specific anecdote of something that's happened to me, but back to what I felt on my road trip when I was coming here. Um, I'm going to draw a weird parallel, but go with me. <laughs> we're, um, good, we're good with weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... I have lived in the district since 2006, 14 years. And so I've been there for a lot of different presidencies. And I would say between 2011 and 2015, the city really changed. And part of that was because Obama was in the White House, but 
him as a president aside, prior presidents, I feel, attracted people to the cabinet and then therefore the adjacent industries who ended up living in Maryland and Virginia, not always in the district proper. And then those who were inspired or desired to work in the Obama White House or the adjacent industries, those individuals ended up coming to DC, living in DC and staying in DC. And that change in consumer spending power completely revitalized the food scene, the arts and culture scene. It created these other industries that were different than that that main one industry town. Uh, And I feel has catalyzed the District of Columbia to the culture that it is today. Uh, And so when I came here, I felt like that same, again, stickiness was reemerging. Like, oh, there's this this culture underneath the main industries that is born and like growing of how might we create this culture and economy that is separate from the big industry here. And, right. and that's what really continues to stay out, stick out to me in coming here is I keep finding people who are a part of that movement. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was going to be few and far between. And I'm like very pleasantly surprised that that is not the case. This place yeah. Is, yeah. is a melting pot, mixing bowl. Mm-hmm. I mean, Walmart has attracted people here from all over the globe. The university has done the same. And the thing that's interesting is there's something in the DNA here that was here before anyone else got here mm-hmm. that says, we're going to figure out how to help that new person out. Mm-hmm. It's really true. I mean, it's part of the reason why people that come here end up staying here mm-hmm. because rather than the sharp elbows and the cutthroat nature you get in a lot of other places, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Somebody mm-hmm. new comes here. It's like, how can we help? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of that. And who can we introduce you to? So it's some Midwestern of this, hospitality. <laughs> well, you know, in, in some of it, and I'm probably, I may have talked about this before, probably bourbon and beer induced <laughs> rats <laughs> beer, but this place was never anybody's plantation. Mm. The Ozarks were a hard scrabble place mm-hmm. where people mm-hmm. had to figure out a way to eke out a living. And so they had to be entrepreneurial. And so if you look at, you look at Sam Walton, you look at Tyson's, you look at uh, J.B. Hunt. This is a place that should have, by no measure, had any prospect of growing those type of businesses. Mm. But because the people were scrappy and because they weren't plantation owners, they had to figure it out. Mm. And so that kind of mountain mindset in some respects, having to be scrappy, not having arable land, that is something that's in the DNA. People have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder here that they're gonna show the rest of the world that it's possible. Mm. And so, and they're also gonna welcome people to come in mm-hmm. and be part of it. Cool. It's, it's been, it's a, it's a culture that's been fun to be reimmersed in after being gone for a lot of years and being back for the last 20 and to see how it develops. Yeah. And to, I think, added, added to that, the, you know, the, the necessity to work hard and hard scrabble, um, but like the collaborative nature too, because exactly. they've yeah. all helped the, Help the, the, the three big industries mm-hmm. grew together, together. And, you yeah. know, because of doing business together and working together. And so no moonshiner that, in the Ozarks was ever <laughs> successful without having a buddy. Truck. Exactly. <laughs> a fast truck. That's right. Uh, a fast uh-huh. truck. That's so, I sure. mean, the, the necessity for collaboration mm-hmm. um, is ingrained. And yeah. I think yeah. as, you know, Continues. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm going to like circle that back to a core principle of mine, <laughs> which is when we develop curate courses, one way in which I measure the success, for lack of a better word, of, of the cohorts is how people do business with one another mm-hmm. and what like cross merchandising opportunities, what business development strategies people might emerge from that class by having that built up social capital together because I find a lot of times we talk about access to financial capital and not enough about access to social capital and if you weren't born into a certain network like how would you ever know certain things and especially for business owners who are women or BIPOC owned who might not again have an uncle who was a lawyer or a mom who was high up at Walmart I don't know whatever whatever it might be how are we building up those communities to 
grow together, Mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we create more of that serendipity of making sure we're, yeah, collaborating in lockstep and not just like going at it on our own? Mm -hmm. Cool. It's already here. (laughs) Collaboration (laughs) seeds are It's in the DNA. There's there's, there's not much of a caste system here. Mm -hmm. Nobody really cares who your your mom or dad was. Mm -hmm. Oh. Tell you the truth. (laughs) Really? So, yeah. Wow. I'm, I am eager for that to be proven wrong to me. I feel like, is that true? Oh, it's 100% true. Okay. Because I'm completely an outsider. I'm a healthy skeptic on this one. Oh, trust me. It doesn't, it doesn't make a difference here. It does not make a difference. Yeah. Now, there's other parts of the state where... Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Who's your mom and dad? What church do you go to, et cetera? That the town is, where that whiskey um, came from. That's... Yeah. Yes. I wasn't going to say little yeah. Yes. But we it's, have a, to it's a difference. <laughs> yeah. It's a different. There is a mm-hmm. difference. And yeah, too, by is. virtue of the fact that, I don't know the statistics, Martha's, um, you know, repeated it at a few events before, the number of people that are coming here from outside of this region, it's, yeah, it's almost impossible for that to be, you know, a major facet because, mm-hmm. you know, 50 to 60 percent of the people that are that make up Northwest Arkansas now were not here five That's years right. ago, right. 10 years right. ago. Right. So it's almost impossible for, you know, those, you know, family relationships, those establishment casts to really take an effect when you're, you've are you repopulated the region mm. with outsiders. Not outsiders, you but... Know, you know, I was at a local watering hole the other day, <laughs> and I asked the people around me uh, when they had moved to the area, and all of them were in the past year and a half. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is... And a, there were like six of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a place that's, that's, because of the DNA, I think, because of nice quality of life and whatnot, attracts people that are looking for a place that people are welcome mm. and it's mm. it's happening I mean, and eager to build yeah. and yeah. granted there Case are in point. granted <laughs> there are families that sure you know yeah. there's every a lot of things are you know a couple of degrees of separation from mm-hmm. but uh, the i mean i would say the core of the people that make up this region uh, are you know independent and mm-hmm. individually driven and collaborative I knew it. The stickiness. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> that stickiness. How much water? Yeah. Here you go. Yeah. Love it. I knew there was Love something it. here for me. And so <laughs> I asked you a question last night, and so now I'm going to ask you again. Ooh. Um, this is completely unrelated to entrepreneurship, but I'm borrowing from Go Rogue's podcast to throw out like one unrelated question. Okay. Um, if someone were to summon you, what three ingredients would they use to summon? Kim Brad. Mm. Oof. Okay. It almost sounds like a legal question. <laughs> 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 you've been, you've, uh-huh. And also you've been served. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Like what three ingredients would like bring me back from the dead like or the, like, yeah, the, you know, the, the, I the witch just, is throwing yeah. these yes, three yes, ingredients yes. into the, the big old pot can, and can stirring be, it up. What are they going to be? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> there are like two ways I, I want to answer this. Yeah. Yeah. Probably all three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are two ways I want to answer this. One is more of like, um, what things really bring me joy and, and I will answer that. And also, in my um, quest, in my road trip of the other year, I actually developed this document that I call the Kim Operating System, or the, the Kim <laughs> OS, which are, is my uh, non-negotiable four core values. So it is not the thing that would summons me, but I, I, that came to me as you were asking me the question. So I'll actually answer, answer this first. Um, I love to dance. And mm. so... Any, uh, and it's not a specific type of dance or music, but something that would be representative of dancing would be thrown into the witch's brew. Um, I've been dancing since I was like four years old, ranging from tap, jazz, hip hop, modern, African, um, Latin dancing, belly dancing. Yeah, all kinds. All the above. Yeah. yeah. In fact, my family and I, I have two younger sisters, I'm the oldest of three. Uh, we make a holiday music video every year. Oh, yes. wow. I'd probably pay some money. You Follow could, me you on monetize. Instagram. Monetize you can that. see our holiday <laughs> music videos. Um, so, yeah, love dancing. We're a dancing family. Um, 
The next thing would probably be something that is about like deep questioning. I this is is related to some one of my core values is that living uh, deeply and boldly into life's questions. I think that I don't know if that would be a book or like someone spouting some philosophy, but that would be another core component to bring me back. I'd be like, what's going on? I need some sort of like questions of the universe here. Um, and maybe the last would be, I mean, something food related. Is that, I mean, that's like the core Obvious, of my yeah. life. Right. Maybe some mezcal instead of bourbon. I don't know. Oh, some mezcal. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll go downstairs okay. and grab we'll some. Yeah. 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 That's true. Right? Yeah, we can yeah. grab some too. Uh-huh. Um, we can go to Yale's. I feel like, yeah. you know, there's got to be like an embarrassing or like, you know, mm. ingredient there that you wouldn't say on air to like, everybody's got that like, hundred thousand subscribers. Yeah. hundred countries. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But <laughs> just <laughs> <between> <laughs> <honest> <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a, I have a food question for you. Okay. Okay. So, um, there's this is a weird lead up, but there's this restaurant in Tokyo that, uh, serves only one dish, one beverage, one music. Every night, it is the same artist and the same dish and the same beverage, and that is it. That is all you can get. And it is truffle pasta, uh, Montepulciano, I believe, red wine from Italy, and Led Zeppelin. Huh. Oh. That's it. Every night, mm. that's what mm. you get. Super so, <laughs> yeah. So if each of you to was going to open a place check that out. with one beverage, one dish, mm, one music, oh. what would you do? This is also That's one tough. of my favorite date questions and interview <laughs> questions. Okay. So uh, feel I'm free in. to take it I'm with in. you. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. Barrel aged imperial stout mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. all you can drink. The food is ice cold, chilled watermelon. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the music is Pink Floyd. Oh, Dark no. okay. Very interesting. Wow, okay. Uh, I feel that? that concept. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> huh, okay. Uh, let's see here. Food, I would have to go tacos, specifically mm-hmm. Torchy's Tacos, being an Austinite and growing up from the mm-hmm. from the food <laughs> truck, from the food truck <laughs> origins. Uh, you know, the going there after practice and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, have to be There's that. some nostalgia there. That's mm-hmm. fine. Some we'll, nostalgia. We'll let it slide. Uh, I really like the Led Zeppelin thing. Mm. I might I might be playing some Led Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. Let's see. It'd have to be some type of beer. You gotta be nah, specific. I know. I know. I know. Go for a <laughs> Michelob. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go light. It's just it pairs well with everything. I'm gonna go Michelob. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Watching your calories. I'm watching my calories. I like to call them salads. <laughs> I like to call them salads. <laughs> yeah. You get your torches taco and have a nice salad with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Like 95 oh, calories. Nice. Yeah. Not bad. My dish would be, um, you know, I like tacos, but I don't mm-hmm. know to, to vary. Um, I'm not a dessert person, but the only dessert that I do like a vanilla bean ice cream. Mm. Is that your Can't dish? That's vanilla my bean dish. Ice cream? Vanilla bean okay. ice cream. A tequila old fashioned. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Two. Those are really good. That. All right. Mm. Uh, that one downstairs got me on those. Those are amazing. Mm. And tequila is an an upper rather than a downer. Um, mm. Where most spirits are um, depressants rather than stimulants. And the music. Ooh, that's tough. Because I listen to everything from. Uh, it'd probably be Johnny Cash. Oh, so I was gonna oh, say oh, some, Cash, something yeah. from. Listen to anything from like Johnny Cash to Three Six Mafia, like it's the spectrum is pretty wide. <laughs> so I would go with uh-huh. probably yeah. go with Johnny Cash because it'd be more that's, that's great you know choice. crowd appropriate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, All right, beautiful. Great choice. No. So, so you gotta go. Yeah. Well, I've I answered this question before, so I have a little bit of a leg up here. But uh, my favorite appetizer. This is gonna sound a little bit bougie, so sorry, everyone. <laughs> is Lay's potato chips with creme fraiche and caviar. Sounds like a DC. (laughs) (laughs) But it's Lay's potato chips. Um, Yeah, so I. Throw a little old bay in. You gotta get the marrow. Ooh, okay, yeah, Yeah. that's interesting. Um, Some sort of like dry, sparkling rose. uh, Could be a natural rose, I don't know. And then a sultry female jazz singer. Maybe it would be like. Yeah, Nina Simone or like Regina Spector, something like that. And. I'm calling it the herringbone. 
and it has sort of like art deco vibes, little plush velvet mm. going on. It's like either a pre, pre-theater, late night. You know, you got to wind down, mm-hmm. be a little sultry. My place is uh-huh. all bean bags. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's just <laughs> like bags. laid out on a yeah. bean bag. Yeah, yeah. vanilla bean yeah. ice cream. With Johnny our, Cash. Uh, tequila, With Johnny tequila. Cash. Yeah, yeah that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> I'm starting to dig this restaurant. I think I know, you know. Yeah. 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 This sounds amazing. There, yeah. right? This is how we come up yeah, with startups, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, Kim, the question we kind of land the plane uh, on, ask everybody that's on the um, podcast, mm-hmm. is if you could go back in your time machine, mm-hmm. the Wayback Machine, go back to 2008, 2009, or even before, um, and knowing everything you know now, what advice would you give your younger self? Ooh. Well, I'm going to go to the deep curiosity I was just referencing. Many a people in my life have told me, wow, you like think a lot or like you're like <laughs> too much, you know, and that has made me feel like oh wow maybe like you're a bit abnormal like sort of like stick in your box you know like don't dial it back yeah and tone it down right and yeah. that one I, if you say that to people please don't this is like a, <laughs> like a warning don't say that that's not kind uh, but I would reinforce to myself that no like asking questions and being a deep thinker and leaning into that curiosity is a huge asset and it's something I if ever I'm speaking at a university or mentoring um, like high school kids, I say it's really important for you to learn a wide swath of lots of different topics because you need to be able to walk into any room and have a conversation with lots of different types of people. And and I'm sure we've all been to panel events where there's a moderator that's asking a question and then isn't listening to the answers. (laughs) And then it's just like, going on to the next question so i also oh, okay <laughs> wow, very interesting so i like couple the the asking of questions and being curious with being an active listener because just like asking questions and then being like obvious you know a little mm-hmm. bit conspiracy theory but like have you thought of that well, like i'm gonna just tell you what i think now you know that's, my turn. Yeah. that's right. yeah. not actually being curious and i feel it's not being curious and really being a learning you have to also then listen yeah. um so i would reinforce that to myself that you're gonna be told this often and don't worry like you gotta keep leaning into it mm. I had a really good mm-hmm. journalism uh, professor one time that told me when when interviewing somebody, you know, you you're tempted to just write down fifteen questions when you interview someone. He said, write down three questions, mm-hmm. which forces you to actually have to listen and ask the next question Follow based on, yeah. on yeah. what the conversation is actually taking place, rather than and question two, exactly. and question three. Good interviewers are in the moment, exactly, yeah. and exactly, and engage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's all all humans, young and old, I would just consider, especially I feel the moment in times we're living in, is just like, why does it have to be this way? Who said it had to be this way? How might we figure out a new solution? You know, just you don't have to always believe the same thing. You know, you can you can really evolve and ask questions. And I would encourage people to do so. Now we're going to land a plane for real. Ooh. <laughs> where, where can all of our hundreds of thousands of listeners in 100 countries find out more about mm-hmm. you and Curate? Yeah, okay. So you can go to curate.co, C-U-R-E-A-T-E dot C-O. Uh, that's the website. And then it's Curate Co. on Instagram and Facebook. Find us there. And I'm at Kim Bryden on all the other things, mm-hmm. Twitter, Instagram, and the like. Uh, but yeah, definitely tune into curate.co. That's where we're going to have applications live for curate courses here in the region. And I look forward to meeting you. Awesome. Thanks for awesome. Yeah. Yes. Thank, Thank you for coming on. This was a great conversation.